Before I open the word, I'd like to just say a short prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide each one of us now as we open your word. May it speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by reading a passage from Acts, the 13th chapter. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I want to start with verses 15 and 16. Acts 13, 15 and 16. It says, uh, and after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now it happens that Paul was in the audience, and Paul began to rose up then. Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. In other words, pay attention now, he says. Verses 29 to 33. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. This is Paul's uh, sermon now to them. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem with all his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you Glad tidings, how that the promise which was made to the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us as their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Paul's comments when he's invited to speak up. So what are the good, glad tidings that, by the way, you like to hear good, good news, glad tidings? You know, we all do, don't we? We didn't have a lot of it this week. But, uh, but we have good, good tidings to share this morning, too. So what are the glad tidings that Paul spoke to those people back in Antioch of Pisidia that day in the synagogue? The resurrection of Jesus here is declared to be the fulfillment of what God had promised to the fathers, Abraham and Israel and David. And that's the good news here in the city where the Jews and other believers who had not heard the good news were gathered. They're living in the shadows and in the darkness. And what Paul is declaring here is abs absolutely astounding to them. Here, this people were still waiting for the promise of God to the fathers to be fulfilled. And you know, it's 14 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven and many of these hadn't heard yet. It's like after World War II. World War II was over. The armistice was signed in, uh, with Japan. And there were people of the, of the soldiers of the Japanese who didn't know the war was over. It was a sad thing as they eked out an existence on some of these islands and uh, not even hearing the good news. And some of us here, maybe, 2,000 years later, Maybe we're still waiting to hear the best news of all and um, to our hearts. They were almost on the verge of despair. Still, still, Paul told them it was already done. What actually had been promised to the, to the fathers? Let's read it in Psalms 105, and it's scattered all through the Old Testament. Psalms 105. This was, were the, these were the glad tidings that um, had been promised to the fathers. Psalms 105, verses 8 to 10. Here's what it says. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham in his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant, everlasting gospel. All through the Old Testament are lots of promises under the everlasting covenant. A covenant, actually the everlasting covenant is a covenantal promise to the people of earth. Indeed, the whole, whole Old Testament 
is a covenant promise pointing forward to Messiah who would come. The Christ event. Actually, this promise, these promises, and there are hundreds of them in the Old Testament, are all fulfilled in Jesus. Let's turn to a wonderful text. This is a, probably one of the favorite texts in the Bible. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. This text comes through better in the New King James. I have the Old King James here, but I'll, I'll mention what it is in the New King James. Verse 20 says, For all the promises of God are in him, are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now in the New King James, it says, For all the promises of God are yes, in him. In who? In Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise that had been made to the church, starting with Adam and Eve, right, out, right outside the gates of Eden in that first covenantal promise. So uh, promises of inheritance, promises of wisdom. They would be a great people, victorious over all their foes. There would be peace in the land. All these were promises that would meet their fulfillment in Jesus. And in Daniel 9, Promises in, with regard to ending the sin problem that was such, a, was such a problem for everybody. I'd like to read to you from Daniel, one of those promises. Daniel 9, verse 24. Daniel 9, verse 24. Here's what it says. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, and upon thy holy city. And then six things are mentioned here. Let's take all the comfort we can out of this. When Jesus uh, is prophesied to have come, these things were all going to happen. These were the promises made to the fathers. Uh, to finish transgression, that's number one. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and the prophecy and anoint the most holy. Six things that were promised, the good glad tidings to the Old Testament church. And during Daniel's 70th week, these wonderful things that were promised, when in the midst of the week, he would bring sacrifices to cease because of his one great human sacrifice that he made on our behalf. If they had been students of the prophecies, they would have known Testimony of Jesus here. And that's what the spirit of prophecy is. It is a testimony of Jesus. It is a revealing and unveiling of Jesus. That's what we had in, this, in the spirit of prophecy. And I'm talking here about all of the prophets, including the prophet to the remnant. So five and a half centuries after Daniel, here was this little group of people in, meeting in a synagogue, huddled together on the Sabbath day in a strange city, still waiting for God to fulfill the promises that were made to the fathers. And Paul shows up and proclaims to them the gospel. It's almost like Jesus showing up in Nazareth and proclaiming his mission statement in Luke chapter 4. When Paul showed up on that morning, they were not a great people, even though they had been promised that, right? Right? They were not a great people. They had no victory over their foes. The iron heel of Rome was grinding upon them. They had no peace. They had no king, no kingdom. Their temple service was in disarray. They had none of these things that they thought Messiah would do when he showed up. And so a couple of visitors show up. Apparently to the, to the uh, leaders in that synagogue, these two visitors may have been from Jerusalem. They figured that maybe they came from the home country and they had some good news to share what's going on in Jerusalem, right? They're a number of miles away. Antioch of Pisidia is in the eastern part of Asia Minor. And when invited to speak, Paul indeed had the best news in all the universe. When Christians show up, there should indeed be good news abounding, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, this town is being inundated with good news right now. 
We should embody a ring of truth. Whenever we open our mouths, it should be, it should be uh, you know, penetratingly truth, right? And, and understandably truth. Can you believe it? In the turmoil of those days, about 45 AD, that's about 14 years after Jesus went back to heaven, Jesus was their peace. He was their wisdom. He was their Passover. Second Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 5, 7, that he is our Passover. Sins forgiven. Indeed, an end of sins. We read though, that list of things. An end of sins had been made already in the person of who? Jesus Christ, who is now their high priestly representative in the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary at the right hand of God. Did God promise to make Israel great? You know, it's an interesting read, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Wow, what a chapter that is. Um, he promised to make them great. He promised to make him the head, not the tail. And uh, God had promised to Abraham the world for a possession. You'll find that in, in um, Romans 4.13. You know, we think a little bit too small. Some places we might have read, well, he, he was promised, he had the promised land. But in Romans, when uh, this is being recounted, God promised the world as a possession to Abraham and to his descendants, the world. In Christ, they were heirs of all things. And God, who fulfills his word in surprising ways, had fulfilled far above what they could ever dream about. He had already done it in the person of one person. Those Jews, so in, I should say this, so in Christ, every promise is fulfilled. Every promise is yes in Christ. These Jews in Antioch that day were not to be considered backward because they didn't understand the reality of the Christ event some 14 years after the cross because even Christians today don't know the full extent of what we have in Jesus 2,000 years later, waiting for God to fulfill his promises. Whereas Jesus, you know, we won't, the question comes, well, what is he doing? And uh, when is he coming? Worried about questions like that when this has already been fulfilled in one person. Many are still waiting for Daniel's 70th week to be fulfilled, for, you know. And that was fulfilled 2,600 years, 2,500 years ago. The reality is that the promises made to the fathers are already fulfilled in the person of one. Do you believe that? Can you believe that? He's our substitute and he's our surety. And because he died for all, then all are dead, right? He's made a provision for every last person that's lived on the earth, 60 centuries of earth people going clear back to Adam and Eve and then to the last person who will live before Jesus comes. And in Christ, I possess all of this. By faith, we can sit in heavenly places every day in him by faith. I'd like to read a special verse that's found in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians is one of those precious um, books about church unity. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right after Corinthians. Ephesians 2, verse 6. And it says, and hath raised us up together. What is the tense here? I like to look at the tense in these verses. And hath raised us up. What is the tense? Past tense. It's done, right? And hath raised us up and made us to sit together in heavenly places. And then that, that little expression that's found all throughout the writings of Paul, in Christ. Can you believe that? He has raised us up to sit with him in heavenly places in who? In Christ. Because he is the substitute you and the substitute me. It matters not 
if the world came crashing down all around us right now, if the roof fell in because of all kinds of turmoil, we'd still have peace as justified believers. In that sense, the last day on earth will not be much different than the first day in heaven when we have that confidence and that trust and that peace that we have in Jesus. In Christ, every believer has eternal life. We had our words of our scripture reading this morning. Then I want to add to that John 5, verse 24. John 5, verse 24. Our scripture reading this morning from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4, tells us that our life is in Christ. John 5, 24. Say amen if you have it. Boy, I like that. Verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. What does it mean when he says, Verily, verily? When Jesus says that, what does he mean? (laughs) It's true. I'm going to tell you the truth now. I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath, hath everlasting life. What is the tense here? Right now, right? hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When you give your heart to Jesus, this is huge. And uh, you can possess that, that blessed hope every single day, no matter what the, what the world is all around us. All this is ours by faith. Abraham believed it 4,000 years ago. And what about us in 2021? We're starting a new year. Not starting out very good around us, right? But we're starting a new year. We're 4,000 years closer to physical deliverance than even Abraham was 4,000 years ago. Perhaps we too could be encouraged by all the good news that Paul brought to that little body of uh, discouraged Jews about 2,000 years ago. And we live by the faith of Jesus. It says in Revelation 14, 12, that they have, that they keep the commandments and have what? The faith of Jesus. It's not merely faith in Jesus. It's the kind of faith that Jesus had, that kind of trust he had in his Father. We can have that today. The Holy Spirit will plant that in our hearts if we ask for it. Maybe if we don't have that kind of faith, it's because we haven't asked for the Holy Spirit to come into our minds. Jesus said you don't have because why? You don't ask. We need to be developing prayer life every day so that we're in harmony with him. Starts in the morning. Jesus got up before the break of day. Sometimes he prayed all night. Sometimes till the dew was forming on his beard, he would pray. You read that in Desire of Ages. Satan is a conquered foe. Let's read about it. This this brings good news to me. Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I don't think we use this verse enough. (laughs) It's tucked away here in Colossians chapter 2. Verse 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and contrary to us. Jesus blotted that out on the cross. That, That all that was against us has been removed. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What an idea. In Romans 6, verse 6, back a few pages. Somebody said the other day, to the left, a few pages. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, now Paul is speaking very positively here, that our old man, what is that? The old nature, right? That our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. A little later, he says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Okay. 
Can you believe it? It took illumination of the Holy Spirit for Paul's hearers to believe this, and some did that morning, no doubt. Whenever the gospel, the purest gospel, is preached, there are some who will believe it. Pray for a heart of belief as the Holy Spirit focuses our spiritual eyes upon Jesus every day. Indeed, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, to point us to Jesus, to show us Jesus every day. You can read about that in John, the 16th chapter, verses 14 and 15. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's his role in the plan of salvation, to show us the one and make it meaningful what he did for us 2,000 years ago. Pray for a heart of belief. Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. We read that, but what was finished? That prom those promises that were made to the fathers have been fulfilled in the person of one. Yet to be fulfilled totally in us, right? We're still here. But it has been fulfilled in one person. God had that day taken the whole human family, 60 centuries of earth people, into himself as the second Adam. He becomes the new father of a race. And we have the privilege, by making a decision, to be a part of that new family, that new race of people. Just like we were all in the first Adam as he fell into sin, the Bible says we're all in Adam, right? You read about that in, in Romans, the fifth chapter. But when Jesus came, the choice was made obvious now. It had been in sacrifice, animal sacrifice, all through the Old Testament pointing forward to this. But when Jesus came, we have, we have a, new, a new Adam. The uh, Spirit of Prophecy calls him the second Adam. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 calls him the last Adam. And he becomes a new father of the human family. All who will decide to become a part of that family by being born again into that family. What a wonderful thing. Just like we're all in the first Adam, as he fell into sin, the whole world was plunged into darkness with only a promise, Genesis 3.15. Just so in Christ, we have a new spiritual father. We all have the privilege to be born again every day into that family, that new race of people. And I would like to have us look at Romans chapter 5, where it talks about some of these things. Uh, Romans 5, verse 12. And... Uh, Romans 5, verse 12. I've never seen so many Bibles in a church congregation before. Not ever, ever. I love it. Verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man, who is that one man? Adam. One man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now let's drop down to verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense one of one, judgment came upon all, all, unto all, upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came, came upon all men unto justification. What's the tense here? The free gift, what? Came. We need to look at this with, with eyes that's, that show that we're involved with this. It's not some pie in the sky someday. Verse uh, 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And then if we could drop down to verse 21. That sin hath raised, reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. A new race who love Jesus and keep his commandments as the evidence of their living faith. Why do they keep the commandments? It's evidence of their living faith. This is not ethereal. It's real. This is rest. In Christ, all the promises of God made to the fathers are yes. That's the gospel Paul preached in Antioch that day. Paul's message was always simple and very encouraging. <laughs> I've got a few texts here. Um, if you're taking notes, some of you are taking notes, I notice. 
It's 1 Corinthians 15. We won't read them. 1 Corinthians 15, actually the whole chapter. <laughs> read it. This, this would be a great Sabbath afternoon read. It'll increase your faith and your trust. That's the truth as it is in Jesus. You can read all about it in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want an encouraging Sabbath afternoon read, that's, that's one of them. Now, all this is by faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. It is finished. Let's believe it. And having believed it, allow the Holy Spirit to come into our minds, into his rightful temple, which is us, the fleshly tables of our hearts. Pray for it. Christ's righteousness is heaven's gift. It's a marvelous gift. Because Christ is our righteousness. He is our life. Righteousness equals life. We have life because of somebody's righteous life. Lived for 33 years in this, on this planet on my behalf. And he said, I want to give you this as a gift. This is the down payment of something that you're going to have over, over in, in glory. In Christ, God answered every true and sincere and, and faithful prayer. He, in Christ, every worthy aspiration is reached. All the promises are yes in him. Now, I want to invite us to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. There's a little thing here that I want to just kind of point out. Ephesians chapter 1. We don't get these blessings from Jesus. It's a mistake to look at it this way because the Bible doesn't look at it that way. We don't get these blessings from Jesus. Now somebody may say, wow, I, th I thought we got all these blessings from him. If we got them from Jesus, we would kind of be separated from him. We have them now and we'll use them, right? But notice what this text says, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, what's the tense here? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And what does it say next? In Christ. We receive all these blessings in Christ. We are saved in the person of another. We're not saved from, from receiving from him, but we're received in him. We receive them in him. I hope that's an important distinction. I hope that we, we can see that. Um, now notice something, that the basis of the promise in the covenant can only be realized by perfect obedience. We don't realize these blessings of the covenant except by perfect obedience. But who in this room has the perfect obedience to say that I'm a good covenant partner with God? <laughs> you know what happens? Jesus became our covenant. He stepped in as our covenant partner and he fulfilled the righteousness that the law requires in his own person. And he says, that's yours by faith. So we're saved within the covenant. Actually, no one will be saved apart from the covenant, outside of the covenant. But we haven't. You know, the covenant is between God and us, we say. But really, it's between the Father and the Son. They made that covenant of peace. So that Jesus, becoming one of us, becomes our covenant partner, stands in our place. He is you and he's me. Because one died for all, then are all dead. So all of us have that potential to be part of that family if we just so choose. There are many working their fingers to the bones trying to be good, but it's never good enough. Actually, <clears throat> well, I won't go there. <laughs> it takes a little too long. But that's the standard. In Steps to Christ, page 60 and 61, it says that the basis of eternal life is what it has always been, perfect obedience to God's law. And, that's, and then she says, we don't have that to give. We have to go to Jesus. Um, all down through the centuries. At Sinai, you remember what happened? They all promised, all the Lord has said, we will what? We'll do. 
But it's more than just doing. It has to be in the heart. It has to come from the heart. It comes, has to come from inside. It has to come from faith. And uh, of course, we all know the sequel to that. But the Old Testament is a, lesson for fa- uh, is, a, is a lesson of failure after failure after failure. Changing gods, changing gods, raising up a judge. And when they cry unto the Lord, and then they go into failure again after the, after the judge dies. It's the story of every man's life experience, even ours. It's the story of my life experience. If I read the Old Testament and see that all history of failure, I can see my own experience in their experience. That's the experience of every man. As a result, notice what the Bible says. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. And then it says in verse 23 of that same chapter, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sounds like it's hopeless, doesn't it? Well, no, it's not hopeless. What those people heard in Antioch that day is what we need to hear today. It's the good news. Uh, people have long faces this last week. We don't need to have long faces. We know what's happening. I said before, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether Trump is the president or whether Biden is the president. One way or another, God is in control of everything. For us to try harder and win the battle with sin is as reliable, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, as ropes of sand. But Paul had good news that day. Notice the mysterious voice from heaven. I want to have you, invite you to turn to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 7 to 10. I think we're going to get done in time today. Hebrews 10, 7 to 10. To, Hebrews 10, 7 to 10. I've looked at these verses with the wrong glasses on sometimes. This is good news. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 7 to 10. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Why did he do the will of God, the Father? For us, right? He provides us with a righteousness that we can lay hold of. He said, gives it to us as a gift. And we don't need to worry about what the Father thinks about us, but what he thinks about Christ, our substitute, in justification. Your sins are forgiven. Your presence in Jesus. That's how the Father looks at us, as though we had never, ever sinned. In fact, justification means, which Paul uses that word so often, means to be declared righteous, even though I am not yet righteous here, totally. That should be a hope for every one of us, because justification means sins forgiven. Our sins should be going beforehand into judgment because we're living in a judgment hour of earth's history. This is... uh, Let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I was going to go read to verse 10, but I want to go on from here. This is from the prophesied servant of Yahweh, the hope of Israel. He's the messenger of the covenant in Malachi 3, verse 17. He's the surety of the covenant in Hebrews 7, 22. He's my surety. What does surety mean? Actually, let's, read, let's look at that. We're in Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews 7, verse 22. Hebrews 7, verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a what? Surety of a better covenant. What does that mean? <laughs> he's a, yeah, he's, he stands in my place, right? He, he pays the bill. He pays the bill. He paid the bill that, that I owe to the law from my conception onward. I was conceived in what? Iniquity, David said. He pays the bill from the beginning onward. Um, So he's the surety of a better covenant. He's my covenant partner, in other words. I can't fulfill the the covenant. Um, The children of Israel couldn't either out there in the desert. All the Lord has said we'll do? No, it didn't happen. Doesn't happen in my life and doesn't happen in your life either, does it? But we have... One in whom, if we are in Christ, who is our surety. 
Now, if we don't know what surety means, you'll know if you co-sign with somebody on a note. <laughs> Anybody made that foolish mistake? I have. <laughs> and pretty soon the bills start coming, right? Somebody didn't pay their part of the covenant. That's, that's where we all are, right? And so somebody steps, steps in and pays the, pays the bill, right? And who is that? If, if I signed the note, that's why I pay, right? So he's my surety. It means that somebody signed off for all my insufficiencies. He passed over the ground of the first Adam. He was victorious where Adam failed. He did it in our flesh. After 4,000 years of sin had marred his, marred his being. See him, weakened by 40 days without food there in the wilderness and doing battle with the devil. He did that for us. And Isaiah is an interesting idea. A messianic prophecy of Christ the Messiah. It's found in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 to 8. Let's turn to that. We're studying Isaiah this quarter. I urge you all to study your Sabbath school lesson. We get a lot from this. Isaiah is the gospel prophet. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee, here's the Father talking to the Son, and give thee for a covenant of the people for the light of the Gentiles. He's the one who is our covenant partner, really. He's the one who fails, who, who was victorious when we failed. Given as a surety for us. What a covenant partner. We can't, we can't do what he did. And because he did, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and helps us to be victorious over sin as the evidence that we're in Christ. Some might ask the question, how come we're saved by grace and judged by our works? Because our works are an evidence that we have accepted the grace that we get in Jesus. So, he judges us by our works. Evidence. When we give our hearts to Jesus, we have just given the Holy Spirit the permission to come into our lives and to our hearts and to make us victorious Christians and overcomers. But don't put your trust in that. We only put trust in the doing and suffering of somebody else, right? There's no merit in, in our, even the best things we do. If you want a reference for that, it's First Selected Messages 344. You'll find some very interesting things on that page and the page preceding that. These verses say that Jesus could not only be the one through whom God would fulfill all his promises, but he would be the one through whom Israel could f fulfill all their indebtedness to a broken law. So Jesus is my substitute and my surety. That's a Reformation idea. The medieval church rebelled against that. It said, no, we're not only saved by grace, but we're saved by our works as well, <laughs> the two of them combined. How would you ever know if you're accepted on that basis? Have I really got good enough works? Some people are struggling. I think some people even in our own church are struggling with that idea. The Lord our righteousness, the Bible says. This obedient suffering servant of Isaiah 53 stood before God as, stood before God as Israel. Indeed, he is the new Israel, the seed. He is the new Israel to do what Israel could not do for themselves. My friends, pray every day for the faith of Jesus. It will draw you through his experience and a crown of victory will be yours at last because of his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's what Paul told those people that day. In closing, I want to read seven promises. In Revelation, let's turn first of all to Revelation chapter 2. 
Seven promises. How many churches were there? Seven churches. They all have promises. We're not going to talk about all seven churches now. But some of the wonderful things that that come in the seven churches. Seven, that's Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, this is 2, verse 7. Feast your eyes on this. Take all the comfort you can out of it. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that what? Overcometh. How do we overcome? They overcame him by the what? Blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. You know, they, they, they had a story to tell. We have a story to tell. A story of overcoming and victory, and victory. But it's not by what we do. It's by what we believe. I'm reminded of that story about the Philippian jailer. And uh, he said, what must I do to be saved? He was, he, was, he was really smitten with all of this. And what did Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Thou and all thy house. To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Then verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be what? Shall not be hurt by the second death. And verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, that no man knoweth, saying he that receiveth it. And verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And chapter 3, verse 5. This is to Philadelphia, or this is to Sardis. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess, but I will confess his name before the Father and before the angels. You know, Sardis was the church that just preceded, that was just before the, the great disappointment. Philadelphia was the church of the disappointment. Let's read about Philadelphia now. Verse 12. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Go, no, no more go out. And I will write upon him the name of God, and the name of the city of God, my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from heaven, not from God. And I'll write upon him my new name. And then the one to Laodicea. Uh, can you believe this one? To him that overcometh, this is to us now, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? I confess I don't know what this means. Grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. What a promise that is. The truth of all of this is that we already are overcomers in one person. That's the person of Jesus. Such good news should cause the heart to sing and the feet to dance. I say that reverently. That kind of news should cause the heart to sing and the feet to dance. Dear Father, thank you for providing with us such a sure and permanent salvation we pray, Lord, for desires in our hearts to give ourselves to you just now and every day. Put in our hearts to spend some time with Jesus every day, searching his word to know you better. And I pray, Lord, that you will be with each one here today. Some are sorrowing. Some are, 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 are in need of, of uh, your, your kind presence in a very special way. I pray you'll work miracles in lives and that you will be with us as we go out into a new and uncertain week. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.